International presented its Global Human Rights Report. It's concentrated on women as human rights defenders. Our reporter Erin Bates has heard how activists in places such as Kolobeni, the Eastern Cape, have pushed back against governments and multinational uh, companies. She joins us now live just to give us uh, an update on this story. So Erin, uh, in particular, uh, also there's been criticism by the South African Human Rights uh, Commission on attempts to silence activists. We're talking particularly about activists in uh, the Amadiba Crisis Committee, uh, among others. Indeed, some very worrying reports here this morning in Rosebank uh, during this briefing from Amnesty International, particularly around the intimidation that some members of the Kolobeni community have experienced over mining rights in that community and some of the pushback from the community, the activism on the ground, uh, from the likes of Nonkle Mbutuma, who will join us shortly. Before we get to that local context and that local case study, Michelle, we're going to hear about the broader Sadak region. I'm joined now by Je Depros Muchena, who is the regional director for Southern Africa for Amnesty International. Mr. Muchena, thank you for your time. Just to start off with, you highlighted concerns over South Africa, Lesotho and Zimbabwe. Just tell us some of the human rights concerns there. Thank you very much. You know, we are launching a report today which is reviewing the year in rights. And one of the things we have done this year is to spotlight the impact of pushback and rights violation in different countries around the world on women women human rights defenders, women leaders who are taking action to defend their communities. So the picture is bleak. Uh, you know, whether you are here in South Africa, we have heard of the case of Nontle Mbutuma, or whether you are in Lesotho, journalists like Keiso, uh, in Zimbabwe, human rights activists like Justina Mukoko, Fatima in Mozambique, and if you go up north to Kenya, you are seeing again women who are taking action to stop extrajudicial killings. In India, Brazil, in Guatemala, in Colombo, in Honduras. There is a big story of women, despite the sexist, misogynistic policies advanced by governments and others in authority, women are pushing back, and it's important that the international human rights movement stand with them at this present moment. How do we move beyond solidarity, or as you said today, calling on government to be far more behind human rights activists rather than the side of those threatening them? How do we move from theory to practice? We have to take a series of actions. One, we need global human rights leadership at an international level. So this threats to defund the United Nations human rights protection system by governments like the U.S. are not helpful. Closer to home, we need the criminal justice system to function. Those convicted of crimes against women, whether they are gender-based violence, rape, and so on, need to be convicted, need to be sentenced, need to be sent to prison, so that we use this as a deterrent mechanism against any other crimes being committed. We need a massive human rights education program by governments, by schools, by institutions, to ensure that we build much more rights-respecting societies, societies that respect the rights of women. At the socio-economic policy level, we need to see a destruction of the gender gap in pay. We also need to liquidate the structures that drive uncare paid work, uh, sorry, unpaid care work that we see across the region so that we bring women up to the center of enjoying their rights. Half the team is not playing. When half the team is not playing, yours will use. Thank you. And from that, we're going to move, Michelle, to this specific case study uh, with Nontle Mbutuma. Uh, thank you, Ma, so much for your time this morning. Uh, you've joined us from the Eastern Cape and brought your son with you. Tell us why it's important uh, to highlight the issue of Kolobeni and the kinds of experiences you've had as a human rights activist. Um, thank you very much for giving me uh, this opportunity. Uh, this uh, case is so important for me because it's about my life. It's about my dignity, it's about my identity, and it's about uh, the future generation. That is why it's so important. Otherwise, if it was just a case, there was no need for me to put my life in risk and put all my energy uh, to make sure that uh, everything is good, because what I'm doing, I'm doing for the next generation to make sure that they are living in a healthy society, in a healthy environment. Otherwise, as us as women, if we are not stand up, our children, uh, they are not going to live in a better space. We need to stand up and voice our own voices to make sure we are being heard. 
And you yourself have shown great courage. Uh, you spoke about the Amadiba Crisis Committee, the threat and, in fact, the, the murder of uh, some of your colleagues, peers and comrades. What are the risks involved in the kind of work you do and why do you keep doing it? You know, uh, after uh, the late chairperson of Amadiba Crisis Committee was been murdered, I was just telling myself, can I go forward or backward? Because uh, he was a stronghold of the ACC. He's, he's the founder. He formed the ACC. Uh, and, but I just said, no, I can't sit. And he was more the one of the person that he was educating us that uh, we need to stand up, especially uh, the youngsters, the youth to stand up because we are the people that we always say that we want jobs, but we never ask what kind of job. Is this job for us or is for somebody else? To, to stand up and to ask questions uh, before we say yes. yes. And you raised some concerns about what's happened post the High Court judgment in the Kolobeni case, this landmark judgment in South African law. What are your concerns following that and where do you see government playing a positive or negative role? You know, after the court, uh, the court judgment uh, in High Court uh, that we, we have a right to consent uh, to a mining as a holder of the land, we were so pleased that, uh, uh, yes, we, we are happy because we, as South Africans, we, we have the most beautiful constitution in the world. And now we see that it working and work for us, not the other way around. But uh, the way uh, the government, some government officials, uh, they take uh, the, that judgment, they are not happy at all. It's seemingly uh, that um, no matter what judges says, uh, they don't uh, take that uh, it's a good thing, but they keep pushing. And it put us as communities that who can we trust if our own government, our own leaders, uh, they push uh, they don't respect the court of law that all of us we think that we are under court of law nobody even you are minister or you what but we are not above the court of law now the way they behave like recently when we heard that minister want to come to Colombia to do what because uh, if he's not satisfied about the court judgment he knows very well uh, what he must do he must appeal uh, the judgment not to come and provoke the community, because the more he comes there, uh, he's uh, provoking uh, the, the situation and the community. That is what we are, pro we are protecting him, yeah. not uh, to, to be disrespected, because this route he's taking, it's a very bad one. Thank you, um, Koska Kulu, for your time and for your presentations today. We're going to have to leave it there, but I am happy to say that uh, we will hear more about Kolobeni on ENCA later today. Um, you will be on Jane Dutton's show uh, this evening, and certainly some very important issues around human rights activism have been highlighted here in Rosebank today.